Aquaturians, and we have Grant Sanderson, and he's going to talk about. One second. Uh, visualization of visualizing Quaternions, and I think a number of you may be very familiar with his uh, YouTube videos, and I know I am, and I'm so happy to have Grant Sanderson with us today. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I just wanted to do kind of a quick little demo of a fun project that a friend of mine and I made a couple of years ago, um, aimed at trying to create some visual lessons around quaternions. And if you want to play along, uh, you can go to eater.net slash quaternions, um, or I, I paid money for the URL 3imaginary1real.com just to get it to, to redirect to this. Um, and there's kind of two fun components <laughs> to the project. Uh, one on the technical side was that we wanted to make explorable videos where um, it's something that I would basically do, do a video where I'm kind of narrating through a certain lesson sequence, uh, but I want it to be the case that at any given point the user can pause and basically interact with the things that I'm doing in the session. Um, and that, that's a whole discussion for the, the magic that my collaborator um, managed, managed to pull off to make that possible. Uh, but here I really just want to talk about what the lesson itself was. Um, and I told that I hope this is kind of useful to anyone in this room who wants to teach other people about what quaternions are. And the basic goal of the whole app is to say, how can we visualize uh, quaternion multiplication in four dimensions? You know, what is it that a quaternion times another quaternion is doing in four dimensions? And how can we use that to understand um, the way that it relates to three dimensions? Um, so I start off with just you know a, a playground that doesn't necessarily have too much explanation, but someone can kind of tweak around some of the numbers that are sitting on here and see that there's clearly a relationship between um, the, the set of four numbers that they set it to and rotations of the sphere in three dimensions. Um, and if they want, they can even give some uh, angle information on that. See maybe there's a relationship between the, the angles um, that are being described and some of what they're looking at. Um, but to build up to what's really being illustrated and to start to do the fun things where uh, it's not necessarily going to be just acting on a three-dimensional three sphere um, by rotating it, but you can instead have it do some more wild things uh, that reflect what's going on on the sphere S3, the, where the water, all the unit quaternions are living. Um, you know, the basic idea is that what we're looking at is a stereographic projection, and that um, if you just take the idea of saying, what if we stereographically project uh, that unit sphere um, of the four dimensions where all these quaternions we care about live on, um, and we just push it down, uh, and then we visualize that, we do something with it. Can, can you build a lesson out of it? Um, and just because the table is awkwardly long, I'm going to sit down and play with this. But um, the way I, I kind of imagined starting this in some of the videos that I made was to first uh, just ask, ask someone, how would you teach complex numbers and complex number multiplication to minus the line lander, which is a little one dimensional creature? who only has a geometric conception of one dimension. And of course, with complex numbers, you know, you can think of multiplication um, as having a scaling component and a rotating component. Scaling component minus is a good way, but the rotating component is a little bit harder. And the way that we'll do it is we, we talk about a stereographic projection from the unit circle, um, which we think of as the circle that passes through the numbers 1, i, negative 1, negative i. And so we tell lines that I'm going to give you this line that you can look at. Um, but the, the center of that line is what I want you to think of as one, as the unit of our multiplication. Um, this new imaginary number that uh, we're teaching him, uh, we say that's going to sit basically one unit above um, where the number one is. Um, and when you multiply by i, and you think about multiplying the number one by i, you kind of imagine dragging the number one up to the number i. And we, of course, have like a nice, beautiful geometric intuition of it with our circle. But Linus just has to think of kind of dragging that number that started at the center of his line up on it. Um, potentially more confusing for, uh, thing for him is the fact that the number negative 1 gets projected out to the point at infinity. Um, but we hope that he can build some intuition if we kind of slide around the line on the right and note how would we uh, take the same motion that took the number 1 to i, but instead we follow what happens to the point that started at i, we have to notice that it slid off all the way towards infinity. And then if we apply that same motion again, uh, which you know is just a 90 degree rotation, uh, that number off at infinity kind of slid back um, to be one unit below uh, the center of this line. And so, you know, I don't really have a lot of high hopes that Linus himself would actually understand too much of what's going on, but the attempt to build some empathy here is important for us uh, when we want to build up to thinking about rotations that are happening on a three-dimensional, um, on a, a 
three spheres sitting at the four dimensions, um, and thinking of how the stereographic projections of various great circles on that three sphere are going to look to us. Um, and, and this is going to be the basic mechanic, where things that in our heart of hearts we should know look like just a circle rotating out there are going to instead look like this um, swift line dynamic. And I, and I think the, the thing to keep in mind is what a succession of 90 degree rotations looks like. Um, as we follow a center point, the first 90 degree rotation takes you up one unit, the next 90 degree rotation launches that off uh, to a point in infinity, the next 90 degree rotation takes it um, from infinity back to one unit below where you start, and so on. Um, the other thing we might kind of find to note is uh, all of the numbers that he's looking at, if we're thinking of them as complex numbers, they're all unit complex numbers. So even though he sees them on a line here, um, he should be keeping in mind that they all have the same magnitude, the same distance from the origin. And the origin is just nowhere in his picture. And so then we step up on our way to maybe empathizing what, uh, what it will look like once we project our turning on sound. Um, and we, we try to kind of do two, two things at once with this like, phase of the app. Uh, one of them is to be looking at a stereographic projection of a sphere onto a two-dimensional space and imagining trying to communicate ideas of rotating a sphere and what spherical rotations look like to a two-dimensional creature, a flat um, And the other thing is going to be to start setting up notation um, that will uh, correspond to the various axes that we care about to the, the various quaternions. Um, and it will be in a, in a failed attempt to have a three-dimensional number system that generalizes uh, complex numbers. So we'll think of the real number axis as being the z-axis. So the z-axis gives us the real number line. Um, we'll have one axis for imaginary numbers, that's uh, i, um, and, and all of the different uh, uh, scalar multiples of i. And then we'll have a second type of imaginary, or imaginary number, j. Um, and you know, we can maybe try to hypothesize, could we come up with a multiplication scheme similar to the one we have of, uh, with complex numbers? And of course, in the back of all our minds, we know that's, that's not going to quite work out the same. But what would the attempt to think about that look like? Um, and I could say, I can let this number uh, in the upper left here represent where the, the point that started at the North Pole, that started at the number one, um, you know, where does that end up um, as, we, as we try something like a multiplication like this? So for example, if I change things so that that number, um, instead of being 0 uh, or being 1, 0 i and 0 j, I think it's 0 plus 1 i plus 0 j. Uh, we notice it moved over that point that started at the North Pole to instead sit at 1 times i. And you know I could move it over to be 1 times j instead. Um, and before we think about the stereographic projection stuff, just right now I want you to look at the sphere and all of that. Um, and one of the reasons that multiplication gets a lot harder for us here is that Whereas in the one-dimensional case, we had this nice uh, coincidence of lower dimensions where each individual point on the circle could be associated with the symmetry of the circle. You know, it's uniquely determined, the symmetry of the circle is uniquely determined by where the number one ends up. Um, we don't have that uniqueness here. We're sort of under constrained. Because if I say, um, I consider some transformation of the sphere that moves the, the point that started at the number one at the North Pole to some prescribed point, like 0 0.65, 0 0.5, uh, 9, you have an extra degree of freedom, which is the rotation about um, basically where the equator ended up. So uh, well, how, you, how you try to square that, realize when you have sort of a two-dimensional set of points on the sphere, um, but you have three dimensions worth of rotation information. Uh, it's kind of the fundamental difficulty with trying to get something analogous to complex number multiplication. And we'll, we'll address that why the four dimensions makes that more friendly. But before we do, uh, let's just take a little moment to think about all of the things that the Flatlander is seeing while we move around our sphere so that um, we can, again, build a little intuition for where this will go. While we start off with the North Pole just sitting at the North Pole, that rotation component looks completely different. To him, it just looks like rotations in the plane, and that's all good. But then if I rotate the sphere, um, let's say 90 degrees, about the y-axis, so I'm going to rotate it so that the North Pole ends up um, at the number i, Take a moment to just kind of anticipate what you think the image in the upper right is going to look like. Um, so if we're trying to predict that, we know that the number one that starts off at the origin, it has to slide one unit to the right. We also know that the number um, that starts off at i is going to slide off to negative one, which is off at infinity. And similarly, the one that starts off at negative i, which is one unit to the left, slides over to the number one. So all of that sliding has to happen as we do this. And kind of the rest of the plane will, will morph along uh, to make that happen. The other thing to notice is how what started off as the equator uh, sitting just 
just as a normal circle. It started as a circle for us in three dimensions, also looks like a circle for the bottom end here. You know, as we look at the stereographic projection of that, it continues to be a circle all along the way. But um, as was said in the previous talk, the cost of this is you get some distortion, and it becomes a bigger and bigger circle. And by the time that you get that circle to pass through the North Pole, what it looks like for the Flatlander is now just a straight line. But we try as hard as we can to encourage the Flatlander to remember, even though it looks like a straight line, it really is still just a great circle. It's just a great circle on the sphere that we're asking you to visualize, even though it's beyond, uh, beyond your level of conception. And so with all of that is attempted empathy building, then we can step up in four dimensions. Um, and let's basically say, we are now in the position of the Flatlander or the Flatlander, and we're looking at a stereographic projection of all of the, all of S3, all of the, um, the unit vectors in four dimensional space projected down. But I have a little drop down menu here that's kind of telling me what uh, parts of that uh, four dimensional sphere we can choose to look at. For example, I've added here the line that passes through the number one and the number i. And so what I mean by that is you imagine in four dimensions, uh, you've got your four different basis vectors. One of them is going to sit along the, the real number line. And we'll sort of think of that as analogous to the, the North Pole, kind of the North Pole direction. Um, and then you have three perpendicular directions to that, i, j, and k. Um, and uh, if you just think of the plane that passes through, let's say, the number one um, and the number i, and I mean, also goes through the origin, uh, that intersects with the, uh, the, uh, the sphere s3 along a circle. And the stereographic projection of that circle is going to be this um, dashed line that we're looking at here. It's kind of yellow and green and all that. And so now, one of the things that uh, uh, we've started doing is playing around with what it looks like when I uh, do some kind of multiplication. Um, and, and it's inviting you to think about the analogies with what the, the line line is thinking about. So for the only points that I'm looking at, I'm just going to look at that circle, and I'll also let the points um, J and K come along. The thing that I'm going to illustrate here is uh, this quaternion at the top, uh, which is going to have four numbers all control. The point, um, which is at some point uh, on the three sphere that I'm calling P, and I've left a Q, uh, a Q number two in here that's uh, just part of the app so that when we um, start multiplying both from the left and the right, we can analyze that. But for the moment, I'll just leave that Q to at um, equal to one. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to slowly change it so that instead of Q1 equaling one, I'm going to make it equal I. And as I do, I want you to kind of predict what happens to this image, what happens to the stereographic projection we're looking at. Um, and I can also maybe add in uh, the number one. So the number one gets projected down to the origin. Um, in much the same way that the Flatlander, when he started off, the number one that was at the North Pole gets, gets projected to his origin. Um, the number i kind of sits one unit off to the right. Uh, I can also add negative one in here, which initially won't be visible because it's off at infinity. And I'll go ahead and also add negative i in here. So we know actually if we multiply by i, um, one should go to i, i should go to negative one, negative one should go to negative i, and we, we see that actually. And what happens to the, the line that I'm displaying is it, it looks just like the stereographic projection of a line that we saw at uh, one dimension. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's nice for some intuition building. Um, but I can also throw on here uh, something to illustrate the other things that's happening, because that's, that's just two out of the four dimensions we care about, the ones uh, spanned by the vector that points to one and the vector that points to i. But if we also throw in the circle that's um, passing through the other two dimensions, j and k, initially, that still looks just like a circle in the same way that um, for the Flatlander, the equator that was uh, uh, on our, our sphere as it got stereographically projected, because it was already on you know, sort of the xy plane, it continues to be a circle for them. Um, that's why we have circles staying as a circle. And it continues to be like that even as we multiply by i. And the, the basic intuition here is that it gets, um, let's see, yeah, the browser wanting to make that so. Um, Oh, no, don't do that. We'll, we'll get to why all things in a moment. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the basic intuition, we know what's going to happen to the circle with one, one eye and negative eye, but then the only other information we need to think about is what happens in those other two dimensions. And it's also a 90 degree rotation, and the, the whole, the fundamental intuition that you can have for thinking about all of quaternion multiplication is this kind of right hand rule, where I consider the quaternion that um, I multiply by I, I kind of stick my thumb in the direction it goes from the projected point of one to the projected point of i. And the direction that your fingers curl are going to tell you what happens to the, you know, the circle that's kind of perpendicular to that, in this case, the JK circle. Um, 
And so we, I could also do this if instead I wanted to illustrate multiplication by j. Um, maybe I bring on here the, the circle that goes through 1 and j. And in that case, I'm going to kind of stick my thumb in the direction that goes from 1 to j. Uh, and I can add on the last circle here, actually, which would be the one that, I guess there's a lot of circles I could add, but we'll do the one that goes through i and k. Um, and you know, take a moment and predict what it's going to look like as I multiply all of the points that you're looking at by the, by the number j. We know that the number 1 has to move to j. j is going to move to negative 1. j squared equals negative 1 is you know, one, of our, um, one of the defining features for quaternions. Negative 1 is going to come to negative j. Uh, but then we also know that in the perpendicular direction, we have this kind of right-hand rule action. So as I, I change my first quaternion to be um, j, we, we, we see that, that happening. And notice this, I left off some of the other information here, and you see a lot more interesting kind of um, distortion happening from this diagram projection on those other two circles, which are uh, possibly a distraction, but also possibly good for intuition building on realizing that um, there's a lot more going on than just what's isolated down to these two circles that make it easy to think about. Um, but one, of the, one of the things I want to emphasize is, you know, let's say you're not necessarily caring about the full, uh, you know, uh, uh, set of quaternions as a thing that spans R4, but you really just care about like, the quaternion group, just a little group of, of eight elements. Um, you can kind of see the, the actions on this group uh, by thinking of those, those right hand rules, or as I multiply by J, for example, we have this cycle that happens um, among four of those, and then another cycle that happens among another four of those. Um, and I think this is actually really helpful if you know, you're looking at something and you say, oh, I've got what is, uh, what is j times k again? And on the one hand, you can kind of think of, okay, you know, is it is it going to be positive i or negative i? But to have a satisfying image in the head where you want to know what, what j times k is, you can say, oh, well, what that should mean is I'm going to be multiplying by j from the left, and so I'm trying to follow what's going to happen to k. And with the little right hand rule, I can kind of predict that, that that point that started at k is going to rotate 90 degrees down to i. So it's going to multiply by j and it's down there. Um, now, the other fun thing is, uh, to think about is what is, what is the difference um, between multiplying on the left compared to multiplying on the right? Um, so even for you know, those of you who are very comfortable with quaternions, it's going to be a fun thing to think about. Uh, if I can bring in again, I've got the circle that passes through um, 1 and j, and I'll also do the one that passes through i and k. Um, I know when I multiply from the left, you know, it, it has this, this motion that both of those circles are rotating, and they're kind of rotating in sync with each other. Uh, so what's the difference when I multiply from the right? Things are not commuted, so it should change in some way. And the only difference is that it basically follows a left-hand rule instead of a right-hand rule. So it still has to be the case that if I say what happens to the number 1, well, I'm still ultimately going to take 1 times j, so it should end up at j. Um, and similarly, if, I'm, if I ask what happens to the number j, well, I'm still taking j times j, and that's to run off to negative infinity. But what, where the difference is, is on that circle that's perpendicular to that one that has um, this, uh, the intersection of the plane spanned by i and k with the, the sphere of the <coughs> That just rotates the other way. And that helps to actually get kind of the fundamental intuition for how to think about this quaternion multiplication as a thing that acts in three dimensions. Because if instead of just drawing these various circles, I say, what if I look at the sphere uh, that passes through i, j, and k? So you imagine up in four dimensions, you have the three-dimensional subspace spanned by the vectors that point to i, j, and k. And if you look at the intersection of that three-dimensional subspace with the, the four-dimensional sphere, there'll be some kind of three-dimensional sphere. And what we're looking at is, on one hand, it's a stereographic projection of that sphere, but it really is just the same thing as the sphere in the same way that for the flatlander, initially, the equator that he's looking at is sort of the same thing as the equator that, um, that we're looking at. There is no distortion. Um, and initially, that sphere does get a little bit distorted. If say, I multiply from the left by j. Because as I multiply from the left by j, um, and all of those quaternions uh, uh, that we just went through follow the paths that they have to to obey this kind of two rotations happening in synchrony, um, then the, the sphere kind of follows the path that it has to to uh, keep those going along. Um, but then if we multiply again from j but on the right, uh, what ends up happening is that the line that passes through, or the circle, rather, I should say, that passes through 1 and j, it'll reverse its motion. Uh, or, sorry, I'll say I'll multiply by negative j. So I'll kind of imagine going the other way. So that initial line is going to 
reverse its motion. You know, first the number one went to j, and then the number j goes back to one. But the circle uh, that's, that's perpendicular to the j axis here, for both of those products, both the left and the right, kind of kept rotating um, in the same direction. So we had a 90 degree rotation uh, applied to it thanks to the multiplication on the left, and then another 90 degree rotation thanks to the multiplication on the right. And this is where the, the angle doubling ends up coming from. So if instead I represent both of these um, quaternions in kind of a trigonometric form, where the real part looks like the cosine of some angle, and the imaginary part looks like some vector multiplied by the sine of that angle, um, then as I change that angle, uh, you know, one of the initially counterintuitive things for someone who's like works in robotics or computer graphics, it comes across the fact that quaternions are mentioned in this line variant, and they might predict, oh, well, what rotation is this going to give me? The angle doubling initially seems a little bit weird. Uh, it's, uh, if I change this angle to something like 45 degrees, that gives me 90 degree rotation about. Um, the thing that's really happening, and if they were curious about what's going on at the four dimensions, you could tell them is, well, actually, that 45 degrees really does mean 45 degrees. It's just that because we're squishing, we're, we're doing this conjugation both from the left and the right, uh, you, one of those quaternions does half of the work. It does that 45 degrees. And then the other quaternion does the other half of the work. And the reason that we have to have both of them working together is if we didn't, if instead we started off, let's say this was at zero, and I just, I just changed that first one, so I'm really just multiplying from the left. Even though we would get that you know, 45 degree rotation that we want, um, uh, on the plane that passes through J and K, uh, the problem would be that it doesn't at all leave the units here in place. Um, it, it's kind of kicking it off because it's also moving around the numbers, in this case, 1 and J. Um, but in order to get the, the units here kind of kicked back into place back where it started, we have to take that other uh, quadrant on the, on the left and then kind of undo the, uh, the distortion that's happening. And all around, like I said, this is something if you want, you can have the website for you, you can play around with it. And it's a, it's a little bit hard to see as you just try changing around some of the different uh, terms that you might set your quaternions to. Uh, the, the circles that you might have started off with, you can kind of see the fact that they are linking with each other. Um, this is kind of connected to the uh, hot vibration ideas that we talked about a little bit more. This that um, you have these pairs of circles that are linked with each other. Um, See which one. So if I take like i times j, and I'm going to get uh, 1 and k thrown in there, and 1 and k. Um, in principle, we know that these are two different, uh, what each of these circles is, is you take a, a two dimensional subspace up in four dimensions, and then you take a perpendicular two dimensional subspace. And so both of these uh, are coming from great circles that share a center. They, they both are centered at the origin, they're both uh, one unit um, in diameter. Um, but they're, they're perpendicular to each other, which is a concept that can kind of only happen in four dimensions. Um, and they're, they're linked with each other. But what we're seeing is this stereographic projection of the two. Um, now, if someone you know, were to ask them, okay, what, what is the, uh, the reason that it, um, it's possible to have some kind of multiplication once we're up in four dimensions like this, when it was really hard down in three dimensions? Because one of the issues with three dimensions is the, you know, uh, if we're considering one of the constraints we have that as you multiply by some uh, attempt at a three-dimensional number that has a real part and maybe two imaginary parts, uh, you know where the number one should go, which should land on that number, but you're left with this extra degree of freedom. Um, you might imagine that should be even harder in four dimensions. You have even more degrees of freedom than during all the rotations of a, of a sphere in four dimensions. And that's true, um, but you can say that uh, this quaternion multiplication is doing something even more constrained than a, uh, than a rotation. It's not just a rotation. Um, it's, a, it's a new kind of thing that happens in four dimensions, which is where, as you rotate along one axis, uh, along one two-dimensional plane, you're constrained by what has to happen in the perpendicular two-dimensional plane, which is that it rotates, that perpendicular 2D plane rotates in the same amount. Um, so that's kind of what we're seeing in this case, let's say we multiply by k here. We're seeing a rotation happen along the circle that passes through one and k. In this case, it's a 90 degree rotation. But then the other plane, the one that's spanned by um, uh, J and I in this case, also has to be rotating that same amount. It's also rotating in its own plane by those, uh, by those 90 degrees. Um, and that's enough then, if you want it to be a linear map, to entirely constrain what the whole motion has to be. Um, and that, that, that was just a, a very satisfying intuition. This, this new kind of constraint becomes available. It's a little stronger than just rotation. 
And that's what gives us a nice one-to-one -one relationship between individual points on the sphere in four dimensions and, um, and the, the actions uh, of a certain kind of symmetry of that sphere in four dimensions. It's not just rotations, but um, you know, it's, it's SU2. So I think with that, I will um, call it an end to the you know, demoing, uh, demoing the thing, phase of things. Uh, but if anyone has questions about uh, this or, or the other fun aspect of the project, which is the whole interactive video component of it, or anything else about it, uh, I'm all there. So uh, uh, if there's any questions, feel free to ask. Yeah? Yeah. 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 Yeah, so uh, quaternions are all pretty new to me. So I'm curious, is it the axes that are changing in the four-dimensional space? Uh, well, I mean, if you think of like a linear map, maybe so it looks, it's basically it rotations of three maybe dimensions. John, like, maybe yeah, ask for the next speaker to come up and start run, setting. Um, the axes changing. John Boyd? <laughs> this, just asking the next speaker. Oh, should I be no, 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 you, you, we, keep you can keep going. We're just trying to <laughs> yeah, sort of bring in the next um, one. Yes, yeah, yeah, so like is John White here? Maybe he's not here? I don't know. Uh, right. Maybe I'm not understanding the question entirely. Yeah, so the axis changing. Well, I just, I just noticed that, like, as you're making a rotation, like, uh, for instance, like, two imaginary axes will rotate. So I'm just, like, curious if this is how like, that's happening. Yeah, I, I guess to, you know, to be very clear, it's like every one of the points that's being illustrated, let's say you choose one of those points and we call it P. And so, for example, maybe the point that starts out with the z-axis here, we call that P. But what I'm looking at is I'm asking, what is the product of the quaternion that I choose up here and that point, which is also a quaternion, um, what is that product in the book? And it will also end up being some other quaternion, which might be some other point in four dimensional space. And then the thing that's being displayed is the stereographic projection of that point. So, for example, if I wanted to know what i times k was, I might say q, q1 here, I set it to the i, and then you know, one of my points was k. So, if I search on here, something's displaying f of k. I'm sorry, f of k is kind of sitting right here. And the fact that it is sitting um, on the y axis. It's, uh, it's telling me, and the fact that it's sitting at kind of negative one on the y axis is a way of telling me that i multiplied by that point, which in this case is k, um, is equal to negative j. Um, it's kind of uh, ends up in the same place where when we start out, we start to convert to j plus j. Which may be a little, it's like there's kind of a lot going on in that. We were a little constrained by wanting to have as much explainable in a single, like, as possible, as opposed to like when I'm making a video on my scaffold where there's just one little piece of it at a time going up. And so this one's kind of like you roll the hood of the car and like it's all sitting there. Um, but then the hope with the explorable video series was I kind of I'm like talking through each one of the little bits one by one and we break it into these eight different modules to like build an intuition for each individual one along the way. Thank you. Yeah, Grant, I have a quick question. What language did you write all this in? It's beautiful. So uh, this is a React app in JavaScript, okay. but there's a lot of this bespoke stuff on there too. Like, um, so I did it with a collaborator, and Peter, he, he took care of most of the program here. I, I did an initial version with a, a Python library and then I wrote it, and then he kind of ported it into the web. But there's a bunch of fanciness, like you know, we use WebGL to speed it up in a way that's not like a default thing with some of the, the canvases not really available. Uh, so it's a little bespoke. I okay. relied on the uh, is it vector graphics? I mean, the, there's uh, there's some vector graphics components to it, but um, it is, you know, like the obviously the glyphs and the text things, but it, it is. Um, it, it is mostly like little surfaces that are actually kind of the, you know, to get the, the sphere, for example, you need like opacity to the surface. And, and, and so it's, yeah, it's a little more than just a three hours. Now that this exists, how much like work would it take to apply something like this to a Fourier series or a convolution? Like, like that? Oh, like for things to be like web apps? Right. Uh, 
you know, it's 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 not easy, uh, and I, there's not like a going to be a universal transition to it. I will say we did actually do a fair bit to uh, take some of the things and then turn them into things uh, that are on the web. Like I think, um, like the four day series, there was like an intern that made a little interactive application for like a four day transform thing. Um, but uh, and honestly, each one, any time there's like putting putting one of these things online. There's not like the universal, you just, you just press a button and suddenly the video turns into interactive, uh, unfortunately. Um, and also, there's not like a huge amount of demand, I think, for people like, like actually landing on the page and playing with it. I think it's, it's very, very fun and they have like a particular select like, audience in mind to do with the project. But it, it's maybe a bit much to do for every single one. So, uh, can, uh, from this main webpage, can we get to the app? That you, that you use for the quaternions? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's definitely on there. I think, okay. Uh, so the, the quaternion, it lives on the collaborators website. It's like the, the domain where it lives, but I'm sure I linked to it somewhere on my own site in terms of um, just like other, other things that are out there. But yeah, I, I think it's... Oh, there it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. uh, but yeah, it's Ben Peters, I think, collaborator on these websites. You've got that. These are all three imaginary, one be all the rest to it. All right. Yeah, we're still looking for. Is John Voigt here? Oh, okay, great. Okay. Um, set up. Set up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.